Hi, I'm here with New York Times best-selling author Tom Parada, and he's here with his seventh novel we're going to talk about, The Leftovers. But before we, we dive into the book, I, I wanted to ask just a few questions about you. Um, I, I heard that early on you knew that you wanted to be a storyteller, uh, or so I read. I don't know if that's, if that's true, but uh, tell me a little bit about that journey. When it, when it first came into your mind that you thought, I'm going to be a New York Times best-selling author. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, 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 was late, that was late in the day, <laughs> yeah, the best-selling author part. Um, you know, I love to read. I think that's the one thing that um, is universal among, among people who end up with writing careers. I had a number of um, false starts in my head. You know, I wanted to be a professional football player, but at, you know, my height, was, that wasn't going to happen. I'm and, with you. And then I was, yeah, and then I was, uh, you know, really int into music and, and played guitar seriously in high school, and, but I didn't have a natural facility that I saw other musicians around me who could, who just had it in them, you know, and um, they could feel it. I could, I could be taught how to do it in a kind of mechanical way, but I, I wasn't feeling it from the inside. And when I started to write, I remember feeling, oh, this must be what those guys feel like when they play guitar. You know, it's like I kind of intuitively knew what I was doing, and that became the outlet, I think, for um, you know, for my creative impulse, which which was pretty strong at that age. I wanted to do something, you know. I was I was born in New Jersey. I know you grew up in no. New Jersey. I actually grew up in Maryland, but I had a lot of family in New Jersey. So I figured when I read that, would you do want to be the next Bruce Springsteen or just in his band or? I, you know, I I actually have had occasional dreams where Bruce calls me up to play in the band. Yeah. Bruce, if you're watching this, please take yeah, care. Yeah, here I am, man. <laughs> and I know the songs. He's still available. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, your work has, has made it onto the big screen, which is a, a dream of, of many, many writers and, and certainly had major success. How was it the first time that you're sitting in the movie theater uh, e eating some popcorn, watching Election or something? What was that? Well, that, like? that was like a really like a dream moment. Um, actually, the, the first moment in that dream was actually going on set. And I just visited for a weekend, and they were doing um, the scene where the election was held in the high school gym. And somebody had gone to the trouble of, you know, making the posters that I had described in the book. and. There, there, were, there was this uh, election, and people, kids were lined up, and they were putting their ballots into these boxes. And you know, Reese Witherspoon was dressed as, as Tracy, and I just had that feeling of this image inside of my head suddenly being, you know, reality. And it was, it was really a hallucinatory moment, I have to say. Um, that I remember feeling like very disoriented at at that moment. But so by the time it was actually on screen, I think I had, you know accepted the reality of, of the movie. And that was more normal in a way. It's up on a screen, I know what that's like. It was actually seeing it staged in real life that was um, Correct. the part that was kind of eye-opening and, and disorienting. Well, the book Leftovers, and I believe it's going to be an HBO series, I'm hearing. We're, we're developing it, yeah. Okay, so as that's in, in development, it's the story of, of, of the rapture, the sudden disappearance, and uh, which is the Christian belief that one day the, the believers will suddenly be, will vanish, and then the rest of the world is, is left. And thus the, the leftovers. And, um, you know, really interesting, you tell the story of Kevin Garvey, uh, the mayor of Mapleton, and his whole family. His, his wife goes off into um, a sort of homegrown cult <laughs> called the Guilty Remnant. His son goes a different way, his daughter kind of stays home. But through this microcosm, this family event, they all experience uh, this, this major event. What inspired you okay, to do well, this? Yeah, no, it's, 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 sometimes I ask myself. Um, I started thinking specifically about the biblical rapture and the idea of the tribulation. So after the believers unite with Jesus in the sky, the people who are left behind go through seven years of tribulation, according to the um, biblical version of end times. It's a time of plagues and wars and, and just misery. Um, and they have a chance to get on the right side and, and fight against the, the Antichrist. But, you know, my book obviously doesn't follow the biblical version of the rapture. It's, it's a random rapture. So instead of providing the clarity of a religious apocalypse, it provides more uncertainty. And what happens is that the conventional religion, religions can no longer explain the world, and they sort of lose power. And 
he creates room for all these spontaneous uprisings like the cult that Laurie joins and the cult that Tom Garvey joins. So the book is really about, in some like primal sense, religion as a response to uncertainty and fear and, and you know, incomprehensible loss. And um, I, you know, worked really hard to get those cults to feel like contemporary American uh, expressions, you know. If, if, if you've read the Left Behind series ever, which, which I have, uh, some of the Left Behind series, it's much more, um, I don't want to say darker, but much more uh, of wrestling with different forces, uh, and you can certainly feel that. In, yeah. In the well, I think the big difference is, you know, the Left Behind series is meant to illustrate point by point, a, you know, a pre-existing theology. And, you know, what you see in it is the people who are left behind understand why they've been left behind. You know, they weren't faithful in the way that they should have been. And it's a call to action for them. And so the book isn't really about grief or confusion, um, which I think would, to me, that way, if people disappeared, that, that's what would, we'd be left with. Um, so I ended up writing, you know, what I call the agnostics apocalypse. You know, this thing happens. It doesn't clarify the world for anyone. It, it in fact, just intensifies their confusion. And uh, the book is really about the aftermath of a big cataclysm, you know. And you could compare it to wars or famines or natural disasters or 9-11, any event that is just so enormous uh, that it kind of stops history. And, and the book is really about the process of, you know, history starting up again of lives returning to normal and some people finding that impossible and other people just saying we've got to create a new reality that reflects this uh, terrible event that we just lived through. And, and yet I've read uh, some of the 9-11 the with the, the 10 years and, and it kind of coincides with the 10 year anniversary of 9-11. The, uh, the fact that no matter what the major event is we tend to, to either not forget but it, it tends to kind of fade in the memory. And, and well, I, I certain that was the most recent one, I think, where, you know, you can remember a week or two after that, just feeling like um, there's going to be before and after. And to some extent there is, you know, obviously a whole era of our lives was informed by that. But I remember thinking even, you know, 2005, 2006, how far away it was starting to seem. And, and um, obviously for, you know, soldiers who went and fought the wars, um, that were a response to that, or people who lost loved ones, it was very, you know, the reality of 9-11 was very strong. But for those of us who weren't directly affected, I think it sort of got, uh, in, it became part of history. It wasn't the monumental event of our lifetimes. It was just part of history. Well, well the book cover itself is, is, is fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, it, with, with the shoes here and the, the smoke kind of fading into the distance. How much input, if any, did you have on the design of this cover? You know, not much. I mean, it was one of those wonderful moments, a little bit like the one I talked about in the, the movie set. You know, I walked into St. Martin's Press, and they said, oh, come on down. We, we want to show you a couple of covers. And they had two versions of, of this, uh, one with a blue background and one with, with this really striking red background. And my first thought was, well, the, the blue, uh, I like blue as a color, and it, it seemed very welcoming. and, and um, Sally Richardson, uh, the publisher there, just said, no, 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 the red, you know, it's much more striking and creepy and, and more suited to the book. And, and she was right, I think the red really is. Um, you know, you see it in a, in a store, for instance, the, the cover really, um, it, you know, I, f I feel like I've been very lucky. My covers often have um, simple objects on them and a, you know, a, a single color background. And they have a kind of iconic feel, I think, and I've been really happy with that. Yeah, your, your covers are very noticeable even on the, the tables outside. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you walk by, you can, you can see it. It does call, call yeah. you out. So it's nice to have a little, uh, it is. A little visual it, it, it identity. Is. In this world of d digital books and the success of digital books, uh, which we all love digital and physical books, it's still, when you have an iconic cover like that, it really does. Yeah, no, no, of course it, it reminds me of, you know, the album cover. Yes. You know, when that was a, just a really important part of you know, the visual environment in the 1970s, say, but, you know, um, and that art, you know, really good art artists were attracted to it. And, you know, book design is really, a, you know, a wonderful, highly developed art right now. And, um, and, you know, it would be horrible to 
not have that as part of our environment. I think they'll coexist for, for, for a long time, fortunately. Well, I've heard you also call this book a, a midlife, uh, midlife crisis book, but more of a midlife book. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why do you call it that? Well, I think that um, in the writing of this book, I realized that the rapture became a metaphor. And for me, the metaphor was, you know, how do we live with, with loss and how do we live with, with our own mortality and the mortality of the people we love or just the people we know and share the planet with. And, um, you know, the way that I ended up explaining to myself, like, life is a kind of a slow motion rapture. That, you know, as we progress, you know, people who are standing right next to us are suddenly not there. You know, maybe it's our grandparents first, you know, and, and maybe it's our parents and then, you know, friends and it keeps, you know, getting closer and closer to you and you have to figure out how to keep going. When really your condition, especially as you get older, you're very aware of it, you're constantly being left behind. You know, it's a really beautiful metaphor, I think, you know, in a, in a kind of secular human sense for um, that, that dilemma. And I think it's something I've become, you know, much more aware of as I've gotten older. Profound. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's, what's next for Tom Perot? Um, well, so, so I'm very interested in this uh, HBO series that we're developing, and that's a long step between, you know, developing and, and actually getting on the air. It's and, not and on not, Tuesday, I'm not yeah, going to see it. <laughs> right, and it's not a certain one. Um, but, but that's sort of um, one of the things on my desk right now. I'm working on a film of the abstinence teacher with Lisa Cholodenko, who did uh, The Kids Are All Right. So that's, right now I'm doing that. And I think the next book may be a story collection. I have um, a number of stories. Uh, I need to write three or four new ones, and I'm hoping I can do that um, in, in the near term, and then that would be the next yeah. step. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us. And uh, I know this book is going to continue to be successful, and many more. And best of luck with the uh, HBO series. Hopefully that works out. Oh, great. Well, thank thanks you. so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks.